Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you will. I just want to, I know she's not here at the moment, but uh, are we recording all right? Okay. Uh, I just wanted to thank Deb, really, for that analogy of the, uh, the word about Gilgal rolling away. And when she spoke about the camel rolling off its burden, it, I don't know whether you ever get funny thoughts come through your mind, but I just got the, the strange thought come through my mind that whenever you get the hump, roll it off onto Jesus. <laughs> I shall never forget that now. It'll always be forever stuck in my mind there. First Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to read the whole uh, chapter there. Verse 1. But at the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that day of the Lord, so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, and travail upon a, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, but that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep in the night, for they that sleep, sorry, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who who are of the day, be sober, putting on a breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that? Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore comfort you together, and edify one another, even as also you do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labour among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace amongst yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, See that none render evil for evil unto any man. But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Obtain, abstain sorry, from all appearance of evil. Important one that. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that called you who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. The word that I uh, felt to bring, the word, if you like, that was given me, revealed to me today, I've called to be sanctified. To be sanctified. We read verse 23 there. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice there that every single part of who we are needs to be sanctified. Spirit, soul and body. And when we read such scriptures as this in, in verse 23 there, do we truly understand 
the standards of God that are behind these statements. What does the word sanctified mean? That's what we're going to look at today. And I want to say over the next two or three times that I bring a message, you can have a gap in between, I know, but the next two or three times to look at some of these words that are used in scripture about us and our walk with Christ Jesus. The first one being sanctified. What does it mean? What does it mean to you personally? Do you know what it means? Have you ever looked it up? Have you ever thought to to look at what the description of this word actually means? It's important. And like many other things, it's something that's not very often discussed, isn't it? Especially from the pulpit. But I think it's something that we, we all need to know and understand because if we don't understand it, how do we know if we are sanctified? And how do we know if we're not sanctified? So let's go on. First of all, what does the word mean? I think it's good to start right at the beginning. Don't you? What does the word sanctified mean? Well, sanctify or sanctified, as it's used in Scripture, in the Old Testament, it's used in both Testaments, in the Hebrew, it is the word kadash. Kadash. And it means the following. To make or to be observed clean ceremonially or morally to appoint or to bid or to consecrate dedicate hallow to make holy to keep or to prepare to proclaim holy to purify or to sanctify holy in the New Testament we have the Greek word hagiatso hagiatso which means simply to make holy. That is, ceremonially, to purify or to consecrate, or mentally, to venerate, to make hallowed, to be holy, to sanctify. Do you get the idea? It's to cleanse, to make pure. Or to declare to be pure before another. As usual, in Scripture, these two descriptions fit perfectly, don't they? In the Greek and the Hebrew, they both really mean exactly the same. And it just shows to me, and I hope to you, the consistency that's in Scripture. There's no conflict in Scripture. Old Testament doesn't conflict with New, and New doesn't conflict with Old. They match perfectly. However, There's an important thing to remember in all of this. And that is that this sanctification, this consecration, this purification, this preparation, which is what we've just heard about in in the description of this, this word, is to a set of standards. It's to a set of standards. We're to be cleansed, purified, prepared to a set of standards. But those standards are not our own. They are the standards of God himself. So then, with this in mind, we need constantly to cut through all the self-satisfying, self-justifying ideas that we all suffer from. We all suffer from them, don't we? Let's be honest, me included. But we need to cut through those as a surgeon does through skin to get to the truth, to get to the the heart of the matter. Because we're looking now at not our standards, which may be good, but we're now looking at God's standards. And they're somewhat higher than ours. These ideas that we can carry ourselves can really dog our life and and prevent us from really drawing near to what God wants in our lives. And so we need to be honest before God, especially 
honest and open with the searching of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need to have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying. Because if we are doing something wrong, if we are living something wrong, if we are thinking something wrong, then that's going to conflict with God's standards, isn't it? And so we need to be able to yield to the will of the Holy Spirit and to bring these things, like it's been said before, bring these things to the Lord. And I was reminded on Thursday of, a, of an old chorus. Oh, what thanks we often forfeit, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Sorry. All because we will not carry everything to God in prayer. If we have a problem, we bring it to God. If we have difficulty, if we're struggling with something, we don't talk about it with our neighbours, we bring it to God. Because only God can truly help. Amen? So that's the word. This is what the word means. It's sanctification, making holy, making pure, making clean, according to the standards of God. That is sanctification from God's standpoint. Now let's, if these are the standards that we're supposed to live to and live by, let's take a look at them, shall we? The high standards of God. And as we go through this message, I, I want you to know one thing and, and understand it and be clear about it. This is not not meant to be a heavy message. This is not a message of, of me standing here and bringing condemnation on you because we're not sanctified before God. That is not what I'm saying today. What I'm saying today is that we need to understand, all of us, me included, need to understand as we go on towards that day that's heading like a freight train towards us, that day of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we get closer to that day, things of the enemy, things that are against us, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, are going to be amplified. Has anybody felt the effects of that just lately? Yes. We're in a battle, brothers and sisters. We are in a real battle, as real as any that are going on in Afghanistan, or in Africa, or anywhere else in the world. In fact, it's even more real, because this is an eternal battle. And so we need to understand, but this is something not to be condemnatory, but to, to lift any burden from us. Lift any burden from us. God doesn't want us to be burdened with a weight. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Didn't Jesus say that? Well, he said what he meant, and he meant what he said. His burden is light, so if you're weighed down, it's not his burden. Okay? But this message, I believe, is meant to free us from any tenuous but seemingly important things in this life that are weighing us down, or do weigh us down, or might weigh us down in the days to come. Is everybody clear about that? I'm not standing here to condemn anybody. God wants us to be free of all that. And to be bold and courageous and light in our lives. Because all this has been dealt with by Christ on the cross. His burden is easy. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. So with that in mind, I hope everybody's clear on that. Cheer up. Put a smile on your face. This is a message of release from the Lord and his word. Let's go on. I think the best place to begin is to be sure that we're looking at this subject from the right standpoint, as it were. We look at ourselves. Have you ever looked at yourself in the mirror? I'm sure you have, yeah. Have you ever looked at your life in the mirror? 
I know I have. And we don't seem, to our own eyes, we don't seem too bad, do we? We're pretty good. We're doing pretty good. You know, we don't do, we don't go out boozing, getting drunk, and we don't do this, and we don't do that, and, and we do all the good things. So, on the whole, we're doing pretty good, aren't we? Yeah. We don't seem too bad. Our lives and our motives and our desires all seem pretty reasonable to us, I'm sure. Yeah. However, this isn't how sanctification works. Remember, we're not working towards our standards. We're working to God's standards. Sanctification has to be viewed from God's perspective, his standpoint, how he views our lives, how he views our motives and our, our thoughts and, and our dreams. Let's look at what Jesus himself said. John 17, verse 19. John 17, verse 19. I'm going to read a few verses from John 17, so you might want to to turn to that. Because they're important for what we're, we're going to talk about today. John 17, verse 19 says this. And for their sakes... I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Jesus sanctified himself. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus sanctified himself. Well, you think, well, he didn't really have to. He was God, wasn't he? Yes, he was, but he was also man. Very God, but very man. And as I think it was Nikos that mentioned last week, somebody mentioned last week, he lived for 30 years before he started his ministry. Before he was baptised. And before he received the Holy Spirit. Yes, he was born without sin. But he had to stay without sin. He had to learn obedience. Scripture tells us he had to learn obedience. Even obedience to death. That was all in his hands. He sanctified himself for us. That we might be sanctified through the truth. But what does that mean? What exactly does it mean? Well, let's read a little bit further. John 17, verse 20 to 23. Neither pray I for these alone, Jesus praying to the Father, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. And the glory which thou gave me, I have given them. How about that? For a statement. The glory that the Father gave to Jesus Christ, He has now given to you. The glory of God now abides in you, albeit in embryonic form, growing embryonic form. I hasten to add. But here in these verses, we've got an answer. We are made to be one with Christ Jesus. We are made to be one with Christ Jesus. We are made new beings. We are made new creations, aren't we? New species. One with Jesus. And as I've said before, in, in other messages, it's all about a change of disposition. A change of disposition. But what does that word mean? What does disposition? Does 
everybody know what disposition means? I'm going to give a, a description because sometimes we can hear these words and think, well, what on earth does that mean? What's disposition? So here's the definition of the word disposition from a dictionary, not from me. Number one, it's one's mental outlook. One's mental outlook. outlook. It's your thought patterns. What motivates your thoughts? Number two, it's your tendencies. Everybody knows what tendencies are, don't they? The things that we want to do. Number three, arrangement. The arrangement of your life, the arrangement of your affairs, the arrangement of your family, whatever. And number four, the final settlement of a matter. The final settlement of a matter. So if you put all that together, it's what motivates our every being, isn't it? Our every thought, our every act. It's what motivates us. That's our disposition. And before we came to Christ Jesus, our disposition was to do what was right in our own eyes. Isn't that true? Scripture bears that out on so many occasions, as I'll, I'll get into later in the message. But our disposition was to do whatever was right in our own eyes. What pleased us? What felt good to me? What pleases me? That's what our disposition used to be like. But now, we are in Christ Jesus. We are made to be one with Christ Jesus. And so therefore, our disposition is now his disposition. Because his disposition, his life, his being, his entity is now imparted into us. And that's what being made one with Christ Jesus means. It means that old disposition is now dead and our new disposition, our new motivation should be his. The things that he desired to do, the things that he wanted to do was to do what was right to the Father. I only do those things that I see the Father do. I only say those things I hear the Father say. Isn't that what he said? I came to do the Father's will, not my own. And now that disposition is or should be in us. Because it's part of who Jesus Christ is. And that's the reality. This new disposition now has to govern our lives, not the old one. This new disposition that we have received must govern our lives now. And we need to allow it to govern our lives. Otherwise, we are rebelling against Christ. We're rebelling against God. But are we open? Are we really ready for the ramifications of what this means in our lives? This is sanctification now we're talking about. Be ye sanctified. As we read in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Wholly. And it's wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, meaning completely. Completely. Because that's what the new disposition is all about. Body, soul and spirit. All in subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look now. That's the reality of what this means. Being sanctified. So let's look at this new disposition for a while. The Apostle Paul, Paul talks about being separated unto the gospel. We read this in Romans 1, verse 1. If you want to turn with that, turn to that. Romans 1, verse 1. I haven't written it down here, so we'll read it together. 
Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. He was separated. The word separated or separate is the Greek word aphorizo. Aphorizo. And it means to mark off from other, other people or other places by boundaries. To limit, to separate, to exclude in a bad sense. They're distributable. In a good sense, to a point and set apart for some purpose. He means to hedge about, to section off for a reason. That's what separate means. And Paul had been separated unto the gospel of God. He'd been separated to God. He'd been sanctified, if you like, unto God. Because that's what it means. He'd been separated off from the rest of the world, from the Pharisees who he'd been brought up under, from the strict religious upbringing, unto a new and living way in Jesus Christ, his Lord. He'd been fenced off. He was separate. And that's what it means. It's used elsewhere in the New Testament, for example, in Matthew 25, this same word. Matthew 25, verse 32, and it says this. You don't need to turn to it if you don't want to. Matthew 25, verse 32. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from the other, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And we know who that's talking about. That's talking about the great shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, at the end, dividing his sheep from the goats. Those who have been faithful from those who have not. Those who believe from those who do not. He's separating them. He's, he's sectioning them off. Calling them apart. Making them separate. And this new disposition that we're talking about has separated us or should have separated us from everything we once were and what we once held dear in this world. That's basically what it means. It's separating us from everything we once were in the old life and everything that we once held dear because this disposition now has different priorities. It has different priorities in its life, in its motivations, in its, in its very being, doesn't it? Because now it's motivated to please God, not please self. It's to separate us from everything we once were and what once held dear in this world unto the new man who now has the mind of Christ. This disposition which drove Jesus to satisfy the will of God in every aspect of his life. Every aspect of his life. Changing water into wine. Raising a leper. Healing a leper. Feeding 5,000. Entering into discourse and debate with Pharisees who hated the very sight of him. Going to the cross. Offering himself freely for our sakes. This was Jesus' disposition. This is the same separation that made the seventh day a Sabbath unto the Lord. It's the same separation which made the Hebrew people a covenant people unto God forever. It's the same separation that made the priesthood of the tabernacle separate from the rest of Israel. They were sanctified. The Levites were sanctified, weren't they? Holy unto the Lord. They were separated and they weren't to be defiled because they ministered before the living God. They were apart from the rest of the people. And they lived apart from the rest of the people. And they had their own 
land allotment which could not be taken away from them. It's the separation that Jesus Jesus described to the Apostle Paul and I want us to read some of Acts 26. Acts 26 verse 14 to 18. Acts 26 verses 14 to 18. And when we were fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose to make thee a minister and a witness both both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things which shall appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance amongst them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And just as the Hebrew people, Israel, the Israelites, were sanctified by the bringing out from slavery in Egypt unto a new life and the inheritance of the promised land, so we are sanctified by the grace of God. We are sanctified by the grace of God in that we have the forgiveness of sins through faith in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our inheritance, if you like, is the new disposition of Jesus. Because that that is the core of everything that was his life. It was the central motivation behind everything he said, behind everything he did. Because everything he did and said was to please and obey the Father. So that's the disposition that we've inherited through faith in him. And as Jesus said to to Paul, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. The faith that we have in Jesus Christ. How much do you believe him? How much do you trust him? How much are you willing to obey him? Will depend to the extent that you are sanctified in him. We need that same disposition. We need that disposition Because we're in a battle, as we've said before. We're in a constant spiritual battle. Sometimes it turns physical. But mostly it's spiritual. We can't see it. But it's going on all around us, brothers and sisters. Because we belong to God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the one who rules this world and its system hates us with a vengeance because we represent everything that he is he is goodness light joy peace rest everything that this world so badly needs is represented in us as we are in him but it all is centered on this sanctification this new disposition of Jesus Christ. So, how does it work? The Hebrew people, the Israelites of the Old Testament, were sanctified unto God and separated from the world by the law that God gave them. I think we all understand that, don't we? It made them different. And the system of sacrifices and so on and so forth to fulfil its requirements. We all know that. It's old news to us, isn't it? 
That made them different. It separated them from the nations around them. Because they were walking in obedience to the standards of God. And that was fulfilled by the obedience to the law and if there was mistakes or errors or whatever, then a way was through the sacrificial system to find temporary forgiveness. But it was only temporary. The feasts were there to help them remember who they were and where they'd come from and who had sustained them and who was sustaining them through this journey and to also point towards the Messiah who would come to be the perfect fulfilment, to be the perfect sacrifice once and for all. In the New Testament we've got Jesus, haven't we? who completely and utterly fulfilled that law in every way, shape and form. And he then gave his own life, even though he himself was totally without sin, to be a permanent and complete sacrifice once and for all time. That act fulfilling the demand for obedience to God's standards. He was the only one that could do that, brothers and sisters. He's the only one who could meet those standards and fulfil them and satisfy the wrath of God for our sakes because of his disposition that is now abiding in you and in me. However, the law has not ceased to exist The law is eternal. But it reflects the standards of God and those standards have never changed, have they? Well, my Bible says that they've never changed. God changes not. There's no darkness or shadow of turning in him. For the sake, though, of man's reconciliation to God, it's now observed in a different way. It's observed in a different way. Jeremiah 31 verse 33 says this, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. This new covenant is not to be obeyed through the strict observance of a raft of rules and regulations and and the obedience to certain feasts and festivals through the year. But it's obeyed through the disposition of Jesus Christ. It's obeyed by living the life of Christ. By trusting in him, believing in him and allowing him to change us from the inside out so that we reflect his disposition not only to the world but to the Father so that we are truly sanctified in him. That's what it means. Sanctification Is this, sorry, this, as our previous scripture has told us, the law is written on the hearts of every believer because the result of salvation and sanctification is that we receive the disposition of Jesus when we are saved. That's what it means. And that will drive us to live to please the Father, as Jesus did. Are we living to please the Father? It's an imparted disposition which will cause a lessening of the importance of the things of this world and a heightened interest in the intensity on the things of God. I'm going to repeat that. Sanctification means that it's an imparted disposition. Remember what disposition meant? Motivation. It will cause a lessening of the importance of the things of this world and a heightened interest 
an intensity on the things of God. Sanctification means that every power of body, mind and spirit are now concentrated on God, not on me. Because now I live to please him, not myself. Many of those who follow Jesus on realising this point turned away from following him anymore. Any of those here who've read John 6.66 will realise why it's numbered 666. Because many turned away and followed him no more. And there are no sadder words in scripture than those verses. Because they realised the reality of what this new life meant. And they couldn't hack it. Jesus prayed in his final great prayer to the Father in John 17 that we might be one with him. We might be one with him. And being one with him is the same phrasing, same wording as that of a married couple. You become one person. Yes? We become one with Christ Jesus. And as Oswald Chambers has so wisely put it, in some of his writings. I'm going to quote here. The only characteristic of the Holy Ghost in a man is a strong family likeness to Jesus Christ and freedom from everything that is unlike him. Let me read that again. The only characteristic of the Holy Ghost in a man is a strong family likeness to Jesus Christ and freedom from everything that is unlike him. These are the characteristics of the man and the woman of God in the kingdom of God. Are we prepared for what sanctification means to us? Are we ready to be set apart for the Holy Spirit to do his work in us? To make you one with Christ Jesus to make you truly one with Christ Jesus. So that his disposition is now our disposition. It'll cost everything that is not of God. So we need to be certain. Just as marriage, we're confronted when we come before the priest, don't we, those of you who are married will remember, hopefully remember, Marriage is not to be entered into lightly. Isn't that what he says? It's a serious thing. And so is being made one with Christ Jesus. It will cost everything that is not of God and we must be certain in our own hearts that that's what we want. So that we don't hold back. But the result of obedience is so worth it. I'm going to read to close John 17 verse 22 to 26 once again. And the glory which thou gavest me, Jesus speaking here, the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. I want you to underline verse 24. Because that's the promise. 
of this new disposition, of this sanctification. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. You are destined to be where he is. You are destined to be one with him. To be one with God. To be one with him in paradise. Eternal presence of God. But we need to be sanctified unto him. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us this special gift of your Son. We thank you for this new disposition, Lord, that you have imparted to us, which is who Christ Jesus was and is. All his motivations, all his desires, now abide in us. And Father God, we pray that as we take this bread and this wine today, that you will quicken these words to us. You will quicken our hearts, quicken our minds, cleanse our hearts and our minds, that we might dedicate them to you. That we might be where you are in that day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.